Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, it is a beautiful day with wonderful rains. Uh, some people don't like this weather, but I know most of us do. I love the rainy season, even if it causes inconvenience. It is a blessing from God. And so we enjoy whatever God gives. The seasons are from God for our benefit. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, even as we come into this uh, time of worship, we have come here. You have come here to worship. So may I ask you to please stand as we prepare ourselves to enter into a time of praising the Lord, a time of giving thanks to Him, a, th a time of celebrating His goodness. You know, the psalmist David says, uh, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. But if I ask you to shout right now, it won't sound like a shout. We need three, four times to tell people, come on, say praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then sometimes at the fifth attempt, uh, a shout is managed. <laughs> but he says, let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. And that is what we want to do. Come with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Amen? Amen. And in his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his. He made it for his hands formed the dry land. Therefore, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Hallelujah. You are under his care. By his command, you receive blessings. By his command, angels are charged to keep you, keep your feet from stumbling and falling. Hallelujah. Therefore, this morning, even as we give thanks to the Lord, let us celebrate his goodness and let us come before him with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on. Put your hands together. Oh 
Hallelujah. We come to worship just the way we are. He accepts us, He receives us. But it is not His intention to keep us that way. He receives us the way we are, and then He looks forward to changing us to, so that we can become more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Do you remember the day when you first had your encounter with Jesus? Do you remember the day when you repented of your sins? You turned from your ways, your past ways, and you came to Jesus and said, Lord, you alone are God. You alone are my Savior, and I commit and I submit myself to you. And that day, Jesus Christ came into your lives, and he became your Lord and Savior. How many of you remember that day? Yes, let me see your hands. Come on, that's your testimony. It is your testimony that that day Jesus came into your lives and he turned things around. He turned your destiny. He changed your destiny. And today you no longer live, need to live under the curse of sin because Jesus is living inside of you. Hallelujah. And this morning I would like for us to sing a testimony. It's a very old hymn, but it is a testimony I know most of you would agree with this. It says, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's sing this. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day.
because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It is the grace of Jesus alone. The grace of Jesus. The wonderful grace. Marvelous grace. Beautiful grace. The powerful grace of Jesus. Because of which we stand today saved, delivered and healed. Hallelujah. Would you cl close your eyes for a moment and just think about how he made it possible for you to receive that grace. He paid a big price. A huge price he paid so that he could show his grace to you. He could shower his love upon each one of us. This morning we stand covered. Covered by his grace. And that is why we are here to say thank you Jesus. And we say, we confess, we acknowledge. And we say it is your glorious grace alone which has brought us through your amazing grace will lead us home it will take us hallelujah blessed be the name of jesus we bless you lord jesus
thank Him for covering us. father on the door who was waiting for his prodigal son to come back he's still waiting to embrace you so that we will just return to his grace and father this morning we lift up our hands and we bow down before your throne of grace because we know it is your grace and mercy that we are not consumed this morning if we can lift up our hands and sing this song it is only because of your grace it is only because of your love that has sustained us thus far lord we remember in genesis chapter 6 when god said god looked upon the entire face of the earth and he found none to be righteous but your eyes fell upon noah as he was righteous and blameless in your sight lord i pray that as you look upon us this church we will be found righteous in your sight lord help us to understand the meaning and the importance of this grace that we have received and live by the power of this grace that you have given to us lord this morning we are here in your presence and i pray if there are people who feel lonely if there are people who feel burden if there are people who need your touch lord you let your grace fill them oh god this morning lord as we sit in your presence have your way in jesus name we pray amen amen you may go ahead and take your seats i would like us to i know you have been standing 
but I would like you to stand for this song that we are going to sing. Let us sing this old, old, beautiful uh, hymn where we exalt the holiness of God as we sing holy, holy, holy the Lord God Almighty there is no one as worthy as our God in heaven he is great and he is greatly to be praised we bless the Lord hallelujah thank you Jesus You play the music the way you know how to play that music from your heart. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty early in the morning our song shall rise to thee holy 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity, holy, holy, holy Lord God of Dorothy. Staying down the golden crown around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Of a sinful man, thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy. There is none beside. Blessed Trinity. 
ਬੈਠੇ around the throne of god the one seated upon the throne and he alone is worthy to be praised we are before the table of the lord here this morning we remember jesus we are not just remembering someone who lived 2000 years ago and then dead and gone we are remembering we are bowing and we are worshiping the one who stands in our midst because you and i have come here in whose name in the name of this jesus hallelujah he was dead but he said behold i am alive I am alive forevermore and he also assured us that because he lives we too shall live and how much we owe to him we owe everything that we are and we have to him and to him alone so as the bible instructs us let the holy men everywhere now when the bible use only men women also included because the bible says in genesis god created man and woman he created the the beginning of that verse says he created man he created man as male and female so what does the bible says lift up your holy hands and i hope and i pray that all of your hands are holy amen, amen. washed in the blood of jesus not our heart and our entire body is his temple lift it up lift up our holy hands and just worship the lord and raise our voices as well this morning we are grateful to god for whatever he has done for the through the last one week and he protected us he provided for us he healed us and he 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 fill us again and again with his life and with the holy spirit and given us that blessed hope that we may look forward to the day when jesus comes and takes us all to himself we are to spend eternity with him in heaven where there is always worship always the sound of glorious holy music and let us not hesitate to say praise be to god hallelujah amen thank you lord this morning even as we come in your presence we rejoice thank you you are worthy of all our worship and praises and i thank you for those who are here and those who are still on the way and we thank you for bringing them all in good health and joy and happiness and as we together sit in your house to exalt your name and then listen to you what you have to speak to us we praise your wonderful name o oh lord we thank you in jesus wonderful name amen and amen praise the lord you be seated please a few sundays ago i read from the book of uh, uh philippians chapter 2 and i shared something that sunday and then i said the rest i will speak some other time 
And I think that time has come today. And so let us turn to Philippians chapter 2. Now this particular passage, Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. I want to say something about this particular passage. By the way, I want all of you to keep on praying for me. I think uh, I am going through a process of a transition. Um, so that is not easy thing to go through a transition. I'm not talking about the transferring. From one level to the next level or whatever it may be, you can interpret. And so that is why the way I present to you the Word of God these days. I'm very much concerned about the shabbiness by which we treat the word of God. I'm not referring only to this congregation, but all over, wherever I go, I notice this. So careless. You know, this particular passage we are going to read again this morning. This passage in Philippians, in this particular chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, is simple but absolutely staggering fact. Yes, yet this staggering fact cannot be even remotely grasped by human mind. And why we don't even spend time to meditate and try to understand what is described here by the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As I said, it is remotely cannot be grasped by human minds if you seriously think about what is written here. The infinite holy creator suddenly becomes in the likeness of his finite and sinful creatures. Now, if you understand it perfectly, I am glad. But I have not understood. I still try to figure out how this infinite God, the Creator, the creator of everything visible and invisible. Must choose to come down to this earth so ugly and dirty by sin and its curses. Perhaps the most profound theological passage in the entire Bible is here. This passage is that serious and that profound. It takes more than a great mind 
uh, there are just a few individuals I am familiar with. I have not met them. I have not talked to them because they are, their IQ uh, was beyond like Einstein I am talking about. And because he understood what this passage means. Many people think he was an unbeliever, atheist and all that, it was just not true. He was a believer. And he used to go to a chapel where the, in the university where he was when nobody is there and sit there meditating this greatness of God and he never used to go to church and I have a quote from him why you used to go to church and the, the preachers and the believers treating the holy scriptures so shabbily and then the explanation is the given was something which you know. One day I will bring you that quote and I will read that quote from him. And so we, we, we think we know the scriptures, we think we understand everything, but in reality we have not understood and that's why the way we are. If we understood our coming into the house of God will be different. The way we sit in his presence will be different. And the way we respect the presence of God will be different. And so, it is my prayer, my brother. I, you know, I include myself to the crowd. We need to be a little more serious and understand this. So. I am going to read this passage one more time. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Apostle Paul begins, what a mind the Apostle Paul had. What a revelation he used to receive from the Holy Spirit to pen down a passage like this. And he did it in a way that he could, with the language he had. But it is for you and me to think, to understand the seriousness of this passage. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. If all of you understand the word nothing, and who he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself further and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. Confess him as what? 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. To what? To the glory of God the Father. Praise God. May the Holy Spirit enlighten us and enlarge our understanding and give us a spirit of listening and understanding. I am not I am not a theologian. I am not a philosopher. I am I am the least among all of you because I I think I can look at you all of you are more educated than I am and before I stand only because of one reason this God of mercy has called me and I just responded to his call and came here and start doing what he wanted me to do, which I am continuing to do it. And there are one or two things that I have added to the list of my ministry. And that is very, very important to me as well. And so all of you have been blessed with the understanding. And I am not even preaching today in the usual sense of the meaning of the word and I am not going to go deeper into anything I just want to convey to you eight things that are revealed in this passage concerning our Lord Jesus Christ and I don't even explain too much. Of these eight, three I have mentioned that Sunday. And then I closed and I said I will, the rest I will mention another Sunday. So that Sunday has come. And especially we are seated in in the presence of the table of the Lord. We are here, you are here, and all of you are here, and I am here. And together, we will sit at the table with the same attitude that is described in this passage. Uh, the, I will remind you of the first three, what we discussed. And I started by stating that uh, this passage reveals the following facts about our Lord Jesus Christ. The number one thing was, uh, he left heaven's glory. And I gave the scripture passages. And I hope those of you who have been writing, it is in your note. And then someone sitting there I request you, there are a lot of scripture passages and uh, as I mentioned, please display it on these screens so that people can write it down and go home and read. He left heaven's glory. My brothers and sisters, you and I will never grasp it to leave heaven's glory and to come down to the darkness of earth. Filled with sin and its ugliness. And, and the second thing I mentioned was he made himself of no reputation. And that, the, the, the correct translation of that is he emptied himself and I try to explain what it really means he emptied himself and, 
and I also said that, that emptied means uh, it means for a while he hid his heavenly fame in an earthly frame for a period of time every aspect of divinity was still there within him he was perfect man and perfect God after his birth. Before that he was just perfect God. And once he was born as a man, he was perfect man. And then there is a tendency to, uh, for some theologians and the great knowledge of people to think that that means he left what happened to his divinity. He lived as a man and he, he, he had a two names, the son of God and son of man. And in his earthly lives as a man, he preferred the title, the son of man. So then what happened to the divine part of this God, nothing happened. It was still there in him. But some of these, these divine aspects like omniscience and uh, omni, um, omnipotent and uh, what is the third way? The omnipresent. These three things, especially that, that is that only God is like that. And that is what is. He was, it was still there. His omnipotence, his omnipresence, and his uh, that, that, uh, uh, and uh, omniscience, everything, all knowing, all powerful. It was all there in him, but what he did was he hid them and he, for a period of time, while he was here on earth, he never ex exercised these divine qualities when he came to be the Lamb of God. That's what happened. And uh, he, he abstained from his omnipresence. He abstains from his omnipotence. He abstained himself from his omniscience. Not that he lost it or he, he didn't have it. He had it. He was perfect God. Everything that made him divine was there. It is still there. But he abstained from exercising some of these things. And the third thing I said was he was made in the likeness of men. And that is the point. These three things we considered that Sunday. And so, you know, he could have been born a Caesar. He could have been born in one of those palaces there. But he didn't. Because he already promised, God Almighty has already promised that the Savior when he comes, he would be in the line of David. Which is found, that prophecy is in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1. The stem, not the root, the stem comes out of Jesse. That's what Isaiah says. And when Jesus was born, Israel was what? He was, Israel was under the heel of Rome. The royal line of David was no longer on the throne. And the David line are already returned to P 
peasantry. Jesse, the father of David, was a peasant, a farmer with a lot of sheep. There was nothing royalty. But God's promise still stood. And how marvelously from the stem of David's line, a root came up and David became the king. And there has never been a king like David. And so let us consider the, I just mentioned only these things with, and I'll give you references from this point onward, point number four. Uh, please, whoever is sitting there writing, make sure that the references are on the screen, as I mentioned. The fourth thing about this Jesus, from glory came down to this earth, he humbled himself, and that means he submitted to authority. And here is a problem area of a human nature. To submit to authority, now there are number of authorities in different levels. We are in a, you belong to a family, the children have authority over you. Your father and your mother are your authority. And the hardest thing for many young people today is to submit themselves to authorities. But you must never forget, God is a God of order from the beginning of creation and the family creation, he is the one who set the order. Who will be in charge? And who will be in authority in a family situation? Your father and then next come your mother. And today's young people think that uh, they were here for what? to provide you with the, your food and clothes and all that and nothing else. And you do whatever you want to know, question should be asked. I'm not talking about you children, okay. Live Spring Assembly children are very nice. But what you notice it today, everywhere, wherever you go, to submit themselves to authority. And then we have the civil authorities, then we have our nation, our country authorities, and so many schools. When you start going to school, you know you have your authorities. And uh, wherever you work, you have your authorities. So many authorities are here to which we have to submit, depending on where you go. And submitting oneself. So when the Bible says he humbled himself, and that means he, he submitted himself to authority. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. I am only mentioning this, write it down, and uh, you go home and read it. I am giving you this lesson. And you know what it means, submitting himself to when he became a man? He agreed to talk our language. He agreed to wear our clothes. He agreed to eat our food. And he agreed to breathe our air. And to uh, agreed to endure our vicious treatment. He submitted himself joyfully and happily to his parents. 
And for 30 years he was there. And he took the responsibility as the eldest son. There must have been at least seven more children. And he, the burden, uh, Joseph died a little early. And so he has to take the responsibility. So he worked hard in his father's carpentry shop. But when his time came, at the age of 30, he knew he has to leave and he left. But until then, he was under the authority of his parents. Setting an example for all of us. And the young people never, never forget the first commandment with the promise is what? Honor and respect your father and mother. That you may have a long life with prosperity. And blessed are those children who remember this and to do it. And the parents don't have to demand it. But the children must be taught. Parents, it is your responsibility. Parents must teach the children these basic principles that would make family life enduring and happy and with the long life with prosperity. Isn't that wonderful? And to compare this statement that we have read in his prayer in the garden. What did he pray to his father? In the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if this cup is something that I must drink, it is hard for me. I prefer that you remove it from me. But I submit to your authority and I will obey. It is not my will. Your will be done. And he chose to do God the Father's will Though that will happen to be something beyond even Jesus to suffer. What was it? It was his separation from the Father. That had never happened in the entire eternity past. That was beyond his ability to think even. The crown of thorn he could bear. The cross he could carry. And the nails he suffered. He could suffer all these things. Because knowing that his father is with him. But then there came while he was hanging on the cross. A period of three hours. When the father left him. He submitted to the authority of his father, which cost him an unbearable thorn. All for whose sake? So ultimately, what is God forsakenness? God forsakenness is hell. I want you to compare that prayer of Jesus in the garden. What he told his father. With Lucifer's statement. 
Where do you find it? Isaiah chapter 14. I want to read it. You open your Bible, Isaiah chapter 14. Thirteen and fourteen. Lucifer was a created angel, the most beautiful, the the strongest, able angel. Look at what happened to him. I want you to read it for yourself. It takes only less than a minute. Isaiah chapter 14, 13 and 14. Are you are reading? And then as you read, try to see the arrogance of it. The, the unwillingness to submit to authority. Where is it all coming from today? Where is it coming? The unwillingness to submit to authorities? And where is it coming today? You just do whatever you are pleased to do with the small girls and the ladies and women and the men, where is it all coming? Whether it is homosexuality or lesbianism or LG, what is it? LG what? LGBTQ. Where is it all coming from? It is all from there. Look at what. Everybody wants to be the highest, the most prominent. And uh, homosexuals and these people's parade is called pride. And that is exactly where is this pride. Where did uh, Lucifer get his desire and pride? And where did sin originate? In heaven. The most holy place, no sin. <laughs> Look at the difference between Jesus' Example for us and Lucifer's declaration. And what did he say? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne. He had a throne, but he says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. His intention was to raise his throne even above the throne of God. And that is the spirit. Get rid of everyone 
get rid of Christianity in the first place. It is they who stands against all these things. Get rid of them. That's what Pharaoh wanted to do. Get rid of the Jews. You know. Kill them. Throw them all men, baby, boy babies into the Nile. Allow only the girls. You know why? The boys will grow up to be soldiers. And that is the spirit. And what did Herod did? When he heard that there was another king born, and he wanted to see the, 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 that boy, he couldn't. And he was so angry, he wanted to get rid of all the boys in Bethlehem. And as a result, 2,000 small ch children were snatched out of mother's hand and in front of them killed them. That is the spirit. What is, why Christianity is the one religion that is persecuted universally? What is that spirit? Why? Because true Christianity stands against all this. They know that. So what do you do? Get rid of them. You must understand the spirit of competition and the spirit of struggle for power. All these things have come from Lucifer. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. Have you, are you declaring? And fifthly, he became obedient unto death. I will only give you the references. Matthew 26, verse 39. Hebrews 5, 8. And again, Hebrew 12, 2. Display all this. He became obedient unto death. Who? Jesus. The Jesus about whom we sing here. And for him, be willing to give your life. How many will dare? How is your faith? How is your determination? Your dedication? Sixthly, he died on a cross. He did not just die, my friends. He did not just die, but suffered the worst kind of death, both physically and judicially. And they could not invent anything worse than what Jesus had to go through. Inflict excruciating, unbearable pain in any means they could. That's what he suffered. And you must always remember the cost of your salvation. And my friends, we are actually neglecting of such a great salvation. Why it is great? Because the price Jesus paid is greater than anyone can ever pay. And refuse this salvation. Many people think that God is so love, loving that he will never send anybody into hell. I agree to that. God is not going to send anybody into hell. 
but millions and millions and billions will end up in hell. Why? It is their choice. The gospel is to be presented to everyone so that everyone may know the way of salvation. And that is why mission, that's why the, the mission should be strengthened in this church and activities of mission, missionary works must be increased. So that as many people as possible within the reach of our um, must hear the gospel message. And when you neglect this, it is beyond imagination. Does God enjoy sending anybody into hell? No. He wants all men everywhere to be saved. That is what he wants. He will not sit there and enjoy as souls by the millions ending up in heaven, in hell's fire. And my brothers and sisters and young people, you must always don't treat the salvation of the Lord so lightly and carelessly. You and I are not worthy to receive his grace. You must understand that. How are you worthy to receive the grace of God and forgiveness from this God against whom we have been sinning? How can we continue to disobey? Many people have problem in taking baptism. Why? Just to go into the waters is it a shameful thing? No, my friends. It is such a great salvation because of the, the, the greatness of the price that Jesus paid. We must be humble. The only thing we were worthy was hell fire. That was the only thing. But only we could plead his mercy. And in his mercy, he accepted us and he forgave us. And now, after salvation, we receive. How do we treat our salvation? What do we do? Let us be true witnesses for Jesus Christ. Let us live as true witnesses. He died on a cross. As I said, he did not just die, but the cruelest methods were used. Their, his trials were all falsehood. But they all said, yes, 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 he is guilty, he is guilty, he is guilty. And seventh, he has been highly exalted by the Father himself. Write down these Isaiah 52, 13. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 17, verse 1. Who can tell me what is the content of chapter 17 of John? Huh? Prayer of prayer of disciples or prayer of Jesus. The whole chapter is his prayer, the longest prayer Jesus prayed in public. Acts chapter two verses th verse thirty three. 
he has been highly exalted hebrew 2 verse 9 hallelujah ephesians chapter 1 a few verses there is my favorite verses anywhere in the bible new testament wow this is is a part of his prayer thanksgiving and prayer apostle paul writes ephesians chapter 1 Did you write down he has been highly exalted by the father himself Isaiah 52:13 John 17:1 Acts 2:33 Hebrews 2:9 and the last and the eighth he has been given a name You know what that means that means he has been given a position and a place of authority he has been given a name a position and a place of authority above all other names all other names ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 verses um, chapter 1 verse 15 till the end of that chapter 23 15 to 23 let us all stand and read this passage oh what a glorious passage it is for the church For this reason ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better i pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority power and dominion and every title that can be given not only in the present age but also in the one to come and god placed all things where under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in a every way Amen. if we can understand the depths ha and the height now everything is placed in heaven and earth and under the earth everything there 
under his feet. For whom? For the church, which is his body. But my, my brothers and sisters, if everything is under the feet of Jesus, there is a mystery here you need to understand. The church is what? It is his body. The church is his body. And the head is Jesus. And the body and head is connected so much that you cannot, the other cannot exist without the other. That is your relationship with Christ. And if church is the body, and everything is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and everything that is, is a place where? Under the feet. Now feet, as you know, is the lowest part of the body. And if that is true, if everything is placed under his feet means under the feet of the church. Because church is his body. And it means when you have that kind of a relationship with Jesus and you walk with Jesus, Everything is under your feet. Amen. Whether sickness or disease or any, anything, you, any problems. You walk with that authority. But in order to do that and experience, and yet some of us go around like what? Like paupers, beggars, all the time begging Jesus. Where fever comes, suddenly run all over the place. Anyone who see on the way, pray for me, pray for me. What is wrong with you? I have a cold. Are? Where is your understanding of your privilege as a disciple? And I wa must warn you, it is not for all the believers. It is for the disciples. You live and walk with Jesus as his disciples. You have all these things under your control. Please, don't, 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 don't call the pastors in the middle of the night to say, the Pastor, please, there is prayer for me. What is wrong with you? There is a pain in my stomach. And in your stomach you ate something wrong. Let that thing go out. <laughs> but there is a terrible sickness. Let it be. How terrible can it be? It cannot be more terrible than the pain that Jesus went through in order to bring you that healing. Yes. You remember that. And you are standing on that authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have therefore to use the, the, the name of Jesus and the authority of Jesus and rebuke. And we have, we have people, ministers, ministering to demon-possessed people and all other sick people, and they show all kinds of acrobatic means to cast out demons. And yet, the demon is still there, then I am going. And it is also true that the response of the first century Christians were very positive. And that response 
is not given these days. When Peter told that man to rise up and walk, and he stood up. He has to. You have to respond. Why we don't see many miracles and healings? Because when we pray for the sick, two people are already standing on left and right of this patient to ca carry him again after prayer. That is not what is to be done. Let that patient have the faith. If they came for prayer, that means they have some faith. Their faith must be such that when the preacher says, you rise up, you rise up. You make an effort to rise up and then you will experience the strength in your body. And that kind of, you, you notice that. In the New Testament, every time they say, you rise up, and they rose up. They did it. But here, the, the, we who are praying, also not praying the right prayer. And the response of the people also know, I, if, I fee, if I rise, I will fall. You will fall, if that is your faith. And so we have to train our people. And also people who come for prayer for healing or deliverance, they need to know how Jesus' power works in it. You have to respond. And for that you yourself should have Jesus within you. And you believe and you follow Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your wonderful presence. Lift up your hands. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 We are before the table of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You be seated, please, with prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is in remembrance of Jesus for nothing else. Only Jesus. Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noon, Jesus in the evening, Jesus through the night. As we prepare ourselves this morning to partake of this supper, which reminds us of the, of the price our Lord Jesus Christ paid. The price has been paid for our salvation. That word salvation should not be taken very lightly. God's amazing grace. And it is truly amazing grace. Only a person like the author of that song can truly understand what is so amazing about grace. Because he was a person who never believed that even God could forgive him. Because he was so deep in sin. He couldn't believe. He would not believe that even Jesus can forgive me. There is no sin under heaven, under the sky he has not committed. And when at the end, when the rays of the light of the grace of God appeared to him, he couldn't believe. He knew he was totally changed. Something has happened to his inside. He knew it. 
and he realized it is nothing but God. And he couldn't believe. The next thing he did was to pen his feelings into that song. Amazing grace. My brothers and sisters, we will be all different if we truly understand that what we have received from the Lord is something that we did not deserve. I am not worthy for it. And yet, it happened to me. Let your song arise. Jesus, he paid the price. And it all happened the night before he was arrested. When he sat with his disciples one last time. This element, very ordinary. He has not left any symbol which is so expensive that ordinary people cannot afford it. No. Think of your salvation. How precious it is. And I believe that all of you are seated here are going to partake of this. But if there is someone who does not have the assurance of salvation and you have not acknowledged Christ as Lord and Savior and confirmed that born again experience by waters of baptism, these two experiences you must have, these two are the two sides of the same coin. Those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. That is the teaching of the Bible. What shall we do, brethren, to be saved on the day of Pentecost? Peter's sermon brought to 3,000 people. And he said, repent. That is the first thing, repent. My brothers and sisters, please understand the meaning of repentance. And the repentance. If you really sincerely want to repent of sin, any sin, read Psalm number 51 and read David's repentance. There you have a wonderful example of a true repentance. Anything less than that is not repentance. And the Bible says, examine yourself therefore if you are worthy to be a partaker of this. This is not prasad. This is not something you give when you go for a festival. No, it is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have any part in my kingdom. This is that emblem. This bread shows the body of Jesus, the broken body of Jesus, his body. That is the meaning. He said, eat my flesh. There is no magic in it. It will remain as this 
in your mouth until you chew it and swallow it and when it goes inside it is not going to turn into the actual blood of jesus either it will remain as they are but what you are doing symbolically you are using this bread as eating the flesh of jesus that's what he said my body my flesh is for the eating my blood is for the drinking symbolically we are showing that you are a partaker of the very life of jesus christ hallelujah everybody say this i am a partaker of jesus life this shows that to sustain that life that is why we take it often god's blessing be upon you as you respectfully reverently partake of this meal this feast and it contains condemnation for those who take it unworthy it also contains healing for those who are sick but your consciences are pure before god so you can either be killed or be healed when you take it rightly and i pray that you will receive the healing power with the prayer and gratitude Heavenly Father we bow before you with thanksgiving These are your people Lord you have redeemed them by your precious blood We have gathered here to celebrate this occasion as you have commanded us So we thank you for accepting this bread in your hand and thank you for blessing this bread with your hand and we receive it therefore from your hand the bread and the wine with your blessing that we be blessed indeed and draw us little more close to you in Jesus name amen go ahead and serve and god's blessing be upon all of you Amen.